Okay, we're finished with our uh, discussion of classical Mendelian type uh, inheritable diseases, and that was part one. We're all going to say a few brief things about part two, which is multifactorial inheritance. And then we'll spend uh, the rest of the time here talking about the chromosomal uh, disorders. Uh, multifactorial inheritance is uh, not just multigenic, but it's multifactorial. It involves things other than genes. And the best way I can explain it is to think of your body, your protoplasm, as a certain type of soil on the basis of all of the genes and all of the factors that uh, constitute that protoplasm. Well, as you might guess, probably your relatives have similar soil, and your closer relatives would have soil that's uh, more close than more distant relatives. So when you think of uh, uh, common phenotypic expressions uh, which are governed by multifactorial inheritance. Think of hair color, eye color, skin color, height, intelligence. We all know that people with these things are generally more likely to have closer relatives which are close, but it can't really be boiled down to one gene, can it? So the uh, general features of multifactorial inheritance is that first of all, expressed by uh, a number of genes. And therefore, you can only talk about chances uh, rather than specific uh, absence or presence of disorders. If you have a disease which is regarded as multifactorial, you have an overall 5% chance that your first degree relatives have it or will have it, like your, your kids, your parents, now, if you're an identical twin that has it, that 5% is a hell of a lot bigger than 5, but it's really way less than 100 as well. Remember, we're talking about soil, not genes. But if you do have first-degree relatives that do have it, then your chances of other relatives is also more than 5%. And in multifactorial inheritance, we talked about things that were... Uh, continuous traits like height and weight, but we're also talking about diseases which are either present or absent or what we call discontinuous traits like diabetes type 2. Either you have it or you don't have it. Many of the uh, diseases classically uh, that can be thought of as congenital as well as many, many common diseases, cleft lip, congenital heart disease, coronary heart hypertension, gout, diabetes, pylor. Does this sound like we talked about all of the common diseases known to man? Well, let's face it. If you have them, your first degree relatives have a, a really good chance of having them too. Uh, and perhaps not quite as much as uh, your second or third degree relatives. And if you do have first degree relatives that have them, then there's even a greater than a 5% chance that another one will have it. And at the beginning of the section on genes, I mentioned that all diseases are genetic. Well, I like to extend that little statement and say more than all diseases are multifactorial. And that's all we'll say about multifactorial disorders. Let's talk about chromosomes now in the third and last part of our uh, discussion on genetics. You know that everybody has 46 chromosomes, uh, 44 of those are autosomes, and two are sex chromosomes, and the male has an X and a Y, and a woman, female, has two Xs. The uh, conventional notation would be to say 46XY or 46,XX, depending on whether you're a male or a female, respectively. They're always uh, looking at these chromosomes, uh, which have been around for a long time, and they're called G-banding because G stands for Gimza, which is the stain that they use to recognize little bands on chromosomes. And yes, Gimza is the same stain that we've seen to look at uh, bone marrow staining. It's very similar to the right stain, actually, which they use for uh, regular peripheral blood smears. And you know that when you look at chromosomes, uh, they have a connection. Uh, 
and then on the basis of that connection, either they have a, a long arm or a short arm. And you know that P stands for the short arm because P stands for petite, and the long arm is Q. So every chromosome has a connection, and then it has a longer arm and a shorter arm. And sometimes the arms can look pretty close, but usually uh, you can see a short and a long arm. And they're also numbered from 1 to 22 in the terms of their overall length. So 1, 2, and 3 are the longest, and you know 21 and 22 are the shortest. So 1, 2, and 3 are in the A group, and 21, 22 are in the G group. And of course, the X chromosome is about three or four times as long as the Y chromosome. And on the basis of that, there's actually a slight difference in weight between the X and the Y chromosome. And that's why male sperm are a little bit uh, nippier than uh, female sperm. Um, when you actually start uh, labeling parts of the P and Q bands, or the P and Q arms, you could then get into an area of each arm called a region. And each region has a band, and every band has a sub-band. And you're basically going from the central mirror, which is the connection, of course, between the two uh, legs, arms, and you're progressing from it away or distal from the central mirror. So here's the classical nomenclature. You have a P, because it's shorter here, and you have a Q, because it's bigger here. Here's your centromere. Uh, so you have your P and Q arm. And then in your P arm, there's a couple of regions, usually a relatively small number. But each region has another couple, two, three parts. And then the called bands. And then bands have subbands. So basically, you could very much label almost every part of a chromosome in terms of saying uh, P, 2, 1, 3. And you're really narrowing out to a, a very small part. And in these parts, for example, in this X chromosome, if you look at the list of uh, uh, sex-linked diseases, you can actually narrow down in this X chromosome where uh, the diseases uh, would occur if the specific part of the chromosome was uh, defective. If you want to go a little bit further than G banding, there's a technique that's been around for used quite often, as a matter of fact, in pathology for tumors as well, called FISH, which stands for fluorescent in situ hybridization. And FISH is really the classical form of gene probes, because in FISH, you actually take uh, little segments, or what they call probably less than, oh, 10,000 base pairs part of the chromosome. And if uh, the complement of that is present, it binds, and if it's not present, it doesn't bind. So it's a very, very logical process. And uh, in fish, is much more accurate than G banding because you can see very, very small deletions, which you can't normally see from regular G banding. You can see complex uh, translocations, and you can see telomere uh, alterations as well, things you just cannot see with uh, G banding. Uh, here is fish, and every one of these little dots represents a part in chromosome 20 because, uh, so in here you could tell that each chromosome, I'm sorry, each complement of chromosomes has an additional number 20. So that's a trisomy 20, isn't it? In this fish study, you can see that they've taken a part that shows, uh, and fluorescently labeled it, that shows that there was a actual deletion in chromosome number 22. Uh, there's also another, I chose this as the uh, title page for this chapter because it looks so spectacular, but you could also label chromosomes with different hues or different uh, bands of color so you actually can have Roy G. Biv uh, li living inside your chromosomes. Let's stop here and uh, we will uh, continue on with uh, cytogenetic disorders in our last 10-minute uh, clip, and I thank you very much.